The first reading this morning is from Exodus. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Now when Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face, but whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining. And Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighted down with sleep. But since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud a voice came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things that they had seen. The Gospel of the Lord. Please bow with me in prayer. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. You know, there's a biblical figure that you find in both the Old Testament reading and the Gospel reading for today, and I don't know if you caught it, but Moses is in both readings. Now, it's interesting because you need to realize that there's, uh, you know, a thousand years or more uh, between that. And so the reality is that what you see in the first reading is Moses in his earthly body, his earthly tent, if you will. And then when you see him again in the gospel reading with Jesus and Elijah being transfigured before the apostles, he's in his heavenly body. But there's something that's in common between the two readings. And that is that because he was in the Lord's presence, there was a glow about him. There was a light shining through him. In effect, his countenance had changed. 
And what we see in the Old Testament, when he went into the tent of meeting, it was his time to spend one-on-one with the Lord, before the Lord in his presence. And when he came out, if you will, the light was shining through him so much in his face that when he met with other people, he had to put a veil over it because of this incredible relationship that he had with the Lord and, and the role that he played in the life of Israel. And then fast forward to the gospel reading where he's standing with Jesus and with Elijah. And what you have there is you've got Moses who would represent the law and Elijah who would represent the prophets coming together now in the presence of the Lord Jesus. And something happens. And in his presence, they also have this glow, this light about them. You know, it's interesting. Whenever we go through something, whenever we have a change, no matter how the change comes or what the change is about in us, there is a reaction that it's difficult for some of us to hide. Do you know what I mean by that? That our countenance will change and it will show when we go through something like this. Early in my marriage with Meredith, probably about 42 years ago, we had an argument about something and I lied. And Meredith looked at me and she said, you're lying. And I said, what? She said, you're lying. And instead of denying it, I said, how can you tell? (laughs) (laughs) And she said, it is all over your face. You can't lie, which is like deadly. And so I've never lied to Meredith since because it's like, I can't. It shows. Now I wonder, are you like that when something's going on inside of you? You have some kind of experience that you talk or you share or something comes out of your mouth and there's a change in your countenance because some of some experience that you've had you hear some joyful news and you're just filled with joy or you have some awful news and you're either filled with anger or sadness but something changes And the change is evident because of whatever happened inside of you, with you, has changed you. And we know that Moses has gone through an evolution of sorts that began back in Egypt when he killed somebody out of anger and then he fled. And then over time he would develop this relationship with the Lord that began with the burning bush and then being used by the Lord with Israel. And all these changes that he went through and then he's meeting with the Lord one-on-one and there's a significant change. You know, have you ever heard the phrase, the eyes are the window to the soul? Have you ever heard that? You know, it's interesting. I tried to do some research as to where that phrase come from. Who's the source of that phrase? And what's fascinating is I can't find one. And I did read one person who said the closest we can come to that is Matthew chapter 6. Let me read to you the, the source of what this guy believes, that the eyes are the window to the soul. Jesus speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. Now interesting, what's that talking about? Is talking about that spiritual health, that life in us because of Christ. That when we have Christ in us, what happens is there's a light that shines or is meant to. And the darkness is gone. In fact, Scripture talks about if you have the light, the darkness cannot put it out. That's what's said about Jesus in John chapter 1. And so what's meant to happen is our faces, our countenance, our lives is meant to change when we have this incredible transformation that comes through Jesus Christ. And that darkness that's in us is supposed to be gone. Now we have this word that we use for this particular Sunday. The word is the Sunday of transfiguration. It's the last Sunday in Epiphany. The word Epiphany means reveal. That what we've seen from Jesus' birth 
until the scripture today is this constant revelation that begins to unfold as Jesus is born and he lives his earthly life. The revealing of his being the Messiah. And what happens this week, Ash Wednesday, and then the first Sunday of Lent next week, is th there's a shift a little bit in what we read and what we'll be talking about. But this transfiguration, what happened to Jesus at that point? Start with Jesus. What happened was, Philippians 2 actually comments on it. Philippians 2 talks about how when he came to earth, he emptied himself. Emptied himself. What did he empty himself of? Well, the best that scholars can come up with is he emptied himself of his glory. Because scripture talks about we can't look upon God. Because he is just, his glory is so intense, the shining, that it's hard for us to look at. And so he went from this person who was filled with humility from the day that he was born, that he was born in a stable, that he was a carpenter and a carpenter's son, that he didn't live in a royal palace, he didn't dress in incredible robes, he didn't have all this wealth. There was no, if you will, worldly glow about him. And his glory would sneak through when he showed compassion and when he performed a miracle and when he would heal someone, there would be these glimpses of glory, but still not the totality of his glory. But when he's transfigured, it's that moment that he reveals his heavenly glory, the light, dazzling light, that you catch a glimpse of his heavenly glory that shines through. It can't not shine through. And so much so, Elijah and Moses in his presence, that that same shines through. It's not what we expect. It's not what the apostles would expect. What did the apostles experience? He hung out with them in this world. He walked with them in this world. He did everything in a human way in this world. He would even wash feet and go to a cross. He was humble. He emptied himself of that glory, but that one glimpse they got was the glimpse of God breaking through completely. This Jesus who would fulfill the law, which is what Moses represents, and he would fulfill the prophecies of the Messiah, which is what Elijah represents. And this is his heavenly presence that they were able to experience. See, when we experience the presence of God and really experience his presence, that's what we're meant to experience. His holiness, his power, his glory that comes upon us and changes us. And that's why we have this change of countenance, that there is a change in your appearance, in your face. I mean, if you really think about it, if we begin to experience Christ as our Savior and we begin to allow his lordship to take over our life. And if we begin to allow the Holy Spirit to fill us and transform us, shouldn't Christ and his light shine through us? That's what scripture talks about. What does that look like? It looks like our lives are beginning to change and we're becoming more and more like him, which means holiness and righteousness, which means we bear his fruit, his character in our lives, that we appear to be a loving person and a joyful person and a person filled with his peace that we become the light of Christ to those around us and our relationships change because we are changing. You know, there are, I, I don't always understand it, but there are people who claim that they are believers in Christ and that they're filled with joy and they ought to let their face know. Because you just can't suppress that. You know people in your life that always appear grumpy? <laughs> well, that was pretty automatic. <laughs> they always appear grumpy or angry. And it's like, you're not always drawn to that, are you? But the people that appear filled with joy, 
And God's grace is just flowing through them and they have a peace about their lives. There's something about them. And their countenance reflects that. And that's what God desires for our lives if we really, really understand. You know, the change that God has for us, which is what we cannot manufacture ourselves, which is why Jesus came to live the life, which is why Jesus went to the cross to become our Savior, and by the resurrection become our Lord, and then send the Holy Spirit to change us, is that we can't change the way God wants to change us. Not by ourselves. We hear in this world phrases like, you just got to have the will, willpower, or just do it, or you can do it. Phrases like that. And with some things, it's true. But with other things, not the way God wants us to change. In terms of holiness and righteousness, in terms of being a blessing to other people in their lives, in terms of bearing the kind of fruit that God wants us to bear, we can't do. I mean, even in, if you're familiar with AA and NA, Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, what do they start with? You're helpless. You're helpless. You can't do it. You need a higher power. In fact, originally, AA was based on the 12 Steps to Holiness. It was a Christian-based program. And the higher power had to be Jesus Christ, if you really understood the basics and the basis of AA. They expanded it to the higher power idea so they could draw other people in. But the source is the Lord, if we're going to change. The change that he has in mind for you, you can't do. To make you who he wants to make you in the image of Christ, you can't do. I can't do. It takes being filled with his Holy Spirit. It's understanding from the very beginning that we need to empty ourselves just like Jesus did when he came to the earth. Come to that realization that we're broken just like Moses did. That God wants to change us and use us and it's by his power and it's through his glory shining through us that we begin to be that light for other people that blessing for other people that he has in mind for us. And we are a blessing in relationships. You know, has, any, has anyone ever said to you, you've changed? Yes. And sometimes, sometimes they say it and it, they mean it like it's for the good. Sometimes they say it and it's like, you've really changed. You know, and it's not necessarily for the good. But the reality is that God wants to change us for the good. You know, if you've been around here more than five years, you probably remember the day when I used to have glasses. And now I just read them because I'm old and I need readers, okay? But back in those days, I started wearing glasses when I was a little kid. I had glasses over 50 years. And then I had eye surgery. And for those of you that remember this, just a few years ago, I used to have a beard. I had a beard for 35 years. And you know what's interesting? Is when I had the eye surgery, people looked at me and said, did you get contacts? You know, in other words, you've changed, right? And when I shaved my beard, people would say, there's something different. <laughs> and it was really funny when people hadn't been to church for a year or two and I'd run in and I'm not there, they'd say, oh my gosh, you look so different. What's different about you? But see, those changes took place with scissors, a razor, and an optometrist. You know, this is not like the Lord intervening, right? It's something that we can accomplish. See, what God wanted to accomplish with me took his spirit, took Jesus going to the cross, took me emptying myself and being filled with him. And it's interesting because it's taken years and I'm still changing because until I'm with him for eternity, that glory is not going to totally shine through me because I still have this earthly body. But it's, it's interesting, years ago, when Meredith and I moved to San Antonio and uh, I was there for five years doing ministry, and uh, I came home one time, and when we left to go back to San Antonio, my sister apparently told my mom, she never told me, but she told my mom, she said, 
Greg's different. Like there's a, he has a lot more peace about him. I don't know what it is, but he's different. This is my sister who's two years younger than me. Mary Grace. Anyway, so my mom told me, of course. And I thought about it and I thought, you know, I used to be in all my relationships. I was so driven constantly. I always had to win. And I was obnoxious about it. And it's funny because that edge that I used to have got knocked away. I still like to win, by the way. Right, Keith? Yeah. <laughs> but I used to have an edge that slowly the Lord shaved away. That I wasn't as obnoxious. I didn't have to always be right. Didn't have to always win. Wasn't quite as driven as I used to be. And my sister noticed. It was interesting. And this is during the time, by the way, that I started having panic attacks and I needed to turn to the Lord constantly. I needed to have his presence to find that peace and that ability to be what he wanted me to be. And he changed me. Now, just to be clear, I haven't arrived yet, lest you think. Okay? But the Lord continues to change me, which is what he wants to do with all of us. It begins at the foot of the cross. It begins like Jesus humbling himself. It begins like Moses realizing he's broken. And Jesus went to the cross so we would understand the depth of our need and the depth of his love so that we might be transformed so that our countenance might reflect him. Let's pray. Lord God, what you want to do with us and in us and through us, we are not capable of. Lord, in and of ourselves, we're weak. Our desires don't always match your desires. And the fruit that we sometimes bear does not reflect your presence in our lives. Lord, I pray for those here who've never come to the cross, who've never emptied themselves, who've never really discovered that they need a Savior. And that's why Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets, to be our Messiah, and by his death, restore our lives, and by his spirit, change us day by day. Lord God, I pray this day that everyone here would know the depth of their need, that everyone would long to have their countenance changed from the inside out to reflect your power, your grace, your glory, your light shining in our lives and through our lives. That we would be blessed and that we would be a blessing to those around us. Lord, change us with the light of your countenance that will shine through us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.